Historian Frank DeCotter has said that the history of communism is a history of endless purges. There always seem to be one more enemy to find, one more imposter to unearth, or one more traitor to root out. In 1969, with Mao Zedong and Chao Enlai declaring victory in the Cultural Revolution, communism and the Cultural Revolution went back to its roots. A new campaign against quote-unquote rightists, people of bad class backgrounds, any old traditions, the four olds that we've gone over in the previous episodes, foreigners, class traders, spies, there was always someone to be found, and millions would be persecuted in this new cleansing of the class ranks, which proved that the Cultural Revolution was anything but over. After the total chaos that the Cultural Revolution created in 1966 and 1967, and 1968, Mao Zedong and the top levels of the Communist Party needed a scapegoat to blame the problems in China on. A fresh round of political infighting would ensue with top-level party members like Liu Shaoqi accused of treachery, but as usual, the brunt of these massive purges and these massive campaigns fell on the ordinary people of China. At this point in the Cultural Revolution, the country really began to resemble more of a military dictatorship, with Mao Zedong dictating orders from on high and his followers carrying them out as well as they possibly could. This is in opposition to some of the earlier phases of the Cultural Revolution where it was a more decentralized, region-based communism. Now it seemed like more of a top-down, authoritarian, oppressive approach. Of course, not to say that anything that happened before wasn't authoritarian or oppressive, as we know. But this purge seemed particularly brutal. This new round of purges was based on some of the old ideas of the Cultural Revolution. Mainly, you were persecuted based on your bad class background or your ties to foreigners. And as usual, the criteria to determine guilt was incredibly vague. Anything from stuttering as you read a passage from Mao's Red Book, or teaching a world history class, or thinking bad thoughts. So you didn't even have to say or do anything. You could be accused of thinking thoughts or having bad feelings in your heart. And sometimes that was all that was needed for an accusation and a subsequent persecution or jailing or execution to happen. A lot of scapegoats at this point were needed, as we know there was quotas that local party members had to fill, and sometimes they just needed to fill those quotas, and that's what got you persecuted. In addition to using the quotas as a way to persecute people, some local communist leaders were just looking to settle old scores. Maybe they had been persecuted themselves during the earlier phases of the Cultural Revolution, and now all of a sudden... They wanted to go on the attack. Here's what historian Frank DeCotter says, quote, In every province, revolutionary committees settled old scores, sometimes charging their enemies with imaginary crimes, occasionally finding scapegoats to fill a quota, invariably using the campaign to crush the local population. End quote. Those that weren't directly persecuted had to deal with the repercussions of their friends and family being persecuted. Obviously, suicides were on the rise, I read about people at universities jumping out windows, drinking insecticide, hanging themselves, so on and so forth. Hundreds of thousands of people would die throughout the country. And this fresh round of purges was particularly bad in provinces where there were communities with borders next to other countries. Usually this meant that there was a large ethnic non-Chinese population, so ethnic minorities. And if you remember from your Cultural Revolution 101, foreigners are the enemy. These are the imperialists, these are the people associated with 
America and capitalism and the so-called rightists. So in places close to Vietnam or Laos or Burma, atrocities and persecutions were even greater than other areas of the country. Plenty of Muslim communities close to these areas felt the brunt of this, and obviously the institutional memories of these communities will never forget what happened during that fresh round of purges in 1969. A good example here of what I'm talking about happened in Mongolia, which is in the northern region of China, and throughout Chinese history, various groups have controlled the area, so on and so forth. It's one of these border zones, and what you have during the Cultural Revolution is a combination of all of these different ways of being persecuted that I'm talking about. So you had ethnic minorities being persecuted, you had political enemies being persecuted, you had ordinary people who weren't enthusiastic enough about the Cultural Revolution persecuted, you had rightists, so-called rightists, and imperialists persecuted, and it really was a combination of everything. Here's historian Frank DeCotter talking about some of these campaigns in Mongolia. Quote, Most of its members had been ordinary Mongol farmers and herdsmen, and they bore the brunt of the campaign. Torture chambers appeared across the province as 800,000 people were incarcerated, interrogated, and denounced in mass meetings. The methods used against the victims plumbed the depths of horror even by the standards of the Cultural Revolution. Tongues were ripped out, teeth extracted with pliers, eyes gouged from their sockets, flesh branded with hot iron. Women were sexually abused, their breasts, belly, and lower parts singed with canes heated in the fire. Men were lashed on the back with leather whips, the flesh torn so badly that the backbone was sometimes exposed. A few people were burned alive. Although less than 10% of the population were Mongols, they constituted more than 75% of the victims. In some areas, almost every one of them was rounded up. At the Railway Bureau in Hohat, all but two of the 446 Mongol employees were persecuted. Large swaths of the Mongol elite, cadres, managers, scholars, technicians, were wiped out. The Mongolian language was banned from all publications. Estimates of the total number of deaths range from 16,000 to 23,000. It looked like a genocide. End quote. I know that's a particularly brutal quote there, and I know some of these persecutions and some of the horrors of the Cultural Revolution might be getting repetitive at this point, but I don't understand how you can talk about what actually happened here without digging into some of those details. And I think you have to try and, as best you can, maintain a sense of what the average person was going through during the Cultural Revolution, which obviously was truly terrifying. It was so bad in areas like this that Mao basically had no choice but to put these areas under almost complete military control. People obviously couldn't live in conditions where stuff like I said in that quote was happening, much less farm work or be productive for the planned economy. It just highlights the extent of the incompetence of Mao where he's constantly cleaning up the mess that he made. He's the one instigating these purges and getting people all riled up and allowing this sort of thing to happen. And then he has to go in when it goes overboard and basically clean up. But the important thing I think to note is that all of that is consistent with Mao's philosophy and his worldview. He didn't care if a purge didn't work out or if a purge went overboard because for him the ends justified the means. Any misstep or miscalculation or horrific event could just be chalked up to, oh, well, that's just one thing that went wrong, but we're on the path to doing something right here. His famous nine fingers to one speech where he said the Cultural Revolution is nine fingers good and one finger bad, well, any bad thing that happened, he could just chalk up to that one finger. Again, the ends justified the means for Mao Zedong. As the purges and the chaos and the rubble of the Cultural Revolution began to pile up in 1969, 
many top members of the party and Mao himself were looking to a solution for some of these problems that the Cultural Revolution was bringing up. What you begin to see in 1969 is a rapid increase in the movement of people to the countryside. So a couple of years ago, remember all those red guards were coming into the cities and the cultural revolution was kind of encouraging that type of thing. Well, now all of a sudden there was a horse shift and many of these red guards and other people were sent to the countryside to be quote unquote re-educated. Mao saw this as one, a solution to the chaos, but also some of these red guards who were just hanging out in the city, like we talked about in the previous episodes, they needed something to do. And Mao also thought it might free some of these big cities from a lot of their overcrowding and resource problems. Over the course of the Cultural Revolution, 18 to 20 million people were sent to the countryside, but it really heats up in this period of 1969. And oftentimes it was the undesirables or the dregs of society that were seen as useless and those were the ones sent to the countryside. So the propaganda machine was rolled out. Mao Zedong gave some speeches. Zhao Enlai encouraged people to move to the countryside. The People's Daily, the communist newspaper of China, said, quote, we have two hands. Let us not laze about in the city, end quote. People looked for justification and found it in the communist Chinese Bible, the Little Red Book of Mao. And once the justification for the move to the countryside was made, millions of people would begin the movement. Initially, there was a lot of excitement from the Red Guards and some of these other people that moved to the countryside. Here is Ray Yang, who was a Red Guard and wrote a memoir about her experience, talking about this move to the countryside. Quote, In my mind, it was a mysterious and exciting place. Vast stretch of virgin land, boundless pine forest on snowy mountains, log cabins, campfires, hunting and skiing, wild animals, hidden enemies, spies sneaked across the border from the Soviet Union at night. End quote. Although many of the Red Guards were soaking up the propaganda, a lot of people understood that this meant the separation of thousands and thousands of families. So many parents were against this and didn't like having to send their kids out to the countryside, basically to fend for themselves. And once the Red Guards got there, some of the propaganda and some of the excitement wore off when they found out just how difficult life was during the Cultural Revolution for people, particularly in the countryside. In rural China, work started every morning. So the Red Guards would be sent out to work in the fields all day. You have mosquitoes biting you, in some cases, huge mosquitoes. Little access to food or water. Most people couldn't clean themselves or bathe. Many people didn't even have anywhere to live. A lot of the houses were full. Most communities, most villages, most communes weren't prepared for the influx of millions of people into their rural areas, and you had a lot of these people just sleeping out in nature. There was a shortage of lumber due to the deforestation during the Great Leap Forward. Kids often had to live in caves. I read about kids living in pigsties, sheds if they were lucky. There was one family who had just buried a relative, they had to dig up the grave, take the wood from the coffin, and give it to a red guard so that they could form some sort of makeshift shelter. There was little fuel or tinder for fire. Obviously, food was scarce. Millions of people were on a starvation diet. And quite frankly, millions of people just lived in sheer destitution. What's really sad about it is a lot of the Red Guards themselves were coming from horrible living conditions in the cities where they had to live with multiple families and single room apartments and they were getting persecuted during the revolution and they didn't have beds or kitchen equipment or anything like that, food much less. 
So they're actually looking forward to going to the countryside, and when they get there, of course, it's even worse. Here's historian Frank DeCotter discussing one case like this where the student lived a horrible life in the city, and then it gets even worse in the countryside. Quote, His family had been forced to barter all their possessions for food, and they used to huddle together for meals on the bare floor, but nothing had prepared him for the abject poverty he found in the countryside. The villagers lived in huts built of grass, straw, and mud. When it rained, the huts disintegrated, melting into the dirt. Whole families had only one set of clothes, hiding inside stark naked. Whatever food there was came teeming with maggots and flies. End quote. There's a famous story that circulated about a top-level party official visiting one of these rural communes. He gets there, sees a shed on the side of the road, and he goes inside and sees seven or eight people just lying on the ground, huddling together with no clothes, no food, no fire, no anything, just trying to survive. So he goes and he questions the local cadre, basically saying, hey man, what the heck's going on here? And the local cadre just shakes his head, throws his shoulders and hands up and says, welcome to rural China. Obviously, in conditions like this, disease and malnutrition were common. Dinner was often salty broth and vegetable leaves. It was extremely difficult just to stay alive. And furthermore, because it was the Cultural Revolution and because any political or social miscue could lead to problems, you were always just one step away from a beating or a persecution or an execution. One student said about the conditions in the countryside, quote, I simply while away the days. I have lost interest in books and newspapers and I've lost any concern for the fatherland's future or mankind's dreams. I merely get through the motions by mechanically eating, working, and eating again, as if I have become a mere beast working to earn a living. End quote. A different student commented on the conditions, saying, quote, My country could not find any better use for us, but dumped us all like dirt in the countryside. The peasants did not need us. We were their burden and only gave them trouble, end quote. Sadly, as you might expect, with millions of young people flooding into new areas with horrible conditions like this and really no law and order to speak of, sexual abuse, sadly, was a major issue. But it was oftentimes extremely difficult for victims to be taken seriously when they brought forward accusations. The only way to truly gain innocence was to appeal to Mao Zedong himself or to appeal to Mao's teachings, again, because that's the only currency that has any value during the Cultural Revolution. But the problem is the whole thing was his idea, so how do you appeal for help and criticize the things that are going on that are a result of what Mao wanted to do? So it was tough for people to do that. One person sent a letter to Mao talking about just some of the horrible conditions that were happening in the countryside, and Mao responded with a letter himself. Here's what he said, quote, Comrade Li Cheng Lin, the issue you wrote about seems ubiquitous around the country and needs to be solved as a whole. Please accept this 300 yuan. I hope it can help you to some degree. Mao Zedong, end quote. Mao really shows his leadership here where he basically just gives that person money and says, go away. Almost completely tone deaf to the situation in the countryside and some of the problems that these peasants were fighting through. One thing that's interesting to note here is that while Mao Zedong seemed tone deaf to the situation that many peasants and rural people were going through, Chao Enlai, on the other hand, seemed like he genuinely wanted to make some modernizations and some reforms to the system. When he heard about the situation with all of this sexual abuse happening in the countryside, 
he proclaimed very loudly and very vociferously that it needs to stop and we need to put an end to this. He even called for basically security teams to be sent out there to gain control of the situation. Allegedly, Zhao Enlai's daughter was a victim of some of this sexual abuse, and perhaps that's why he was so loud and angry about it. But the people of China noticed this, and Zhao Enlai often gets credit for being a quote-unquote modernizer and someone who wanted to reform the system from inside. I'm not sure if that's entirely fair to just paint him like that because he also took part in many of the horrors of the Cultural Revolution. He did follow along with a lot of what Mao was doing, so he's a complicated figure. But what's important to note is that the people of China considered him as someone who had their backs particularly Red Guards and students who were going through some horrible times. And it wasn't just the students and the young people who were struggling. Anyone who was seen as an undesirable or not useful for the communist economy was sent to the countryside as well. Anyone who was seen as a drain on resources. So this could be students, Red Guards, old people, retired people, unemployed people, sick people. And it's sad because it really is a form of eugenics in its own way. Anyone who wasn't seen as useful was sent out to the countryside basically to wither away. There were re-education centers that many of these undesirables found themselves at, and oftentimes it was nothing more than a few sheds in the middle of nowhere with arbitrary and meaningless manual labor. This was the norm. Oftentimes you had to move bricks from place to place all day long for no reason whatsoever. I think it's important to note that you have to think about just the massive amount of wasted talent. Remember, the people who are getting re-educated here and the people who are bearing the brunt of the Cultural Revolution from a victim perspective are educators people with educations, engineers, philosophers, scientists, doctors, and all of these people are just wasting away in the countryside, moving bricks around. Students and Red Guards as well. We've talked about how horrible from our modern perspective their education that they were getting during this period was, but now they're just kind of wasting away the future of China, and what's it all for? Ultimately, What it was for was a made-up revolution against an enemy that didn't exist, fought for arbitrary reasons, and with no clear goals or no clear endgame in sight. Obviously, it's upsetting to think about all this now and to learn about it, but the people at the time period, the regular, ordinary people in China, they were thinking about it too, and they weren't stupid. Many people realized that There was no real enemy here. The enemy doesn't exist. And therefore, the whole motivating factor for the Cultural Revolution is a sham. So Mao Zedong and the Communist Party, being Mao Zedong and the Communist Party, recognized this and sought to rectify the situation. The results, as you might guess, were especially horrifying. The solution that Mao comes up with for this problem of not having a real enemy to motivate the people was to take a small border skirmish with the Soviet Union, probably something that he instigated himself, exaggerate the heck out of it, and then mobilize the entire country for World War III. Welcome to the Cultural Revolution. If you haven't been paying attention, nothing is too hyperbolic. Nothing is out of bounds, and nothing should surprise you at this point. Mao Zedong said that the country should be ready to, quote, fight a great war, an early war, and even a nuclear war, end quote. While this was probably unnecessary, and it certainly did help Mao as far as getting the people mobilized for the Cultural Revolution, in addition to getting mobilized for war, (laughs) 
there were some amount of tensions that did heat up between China, the Soviet Union, and even the United States. It seemed like some members of the Soviet power structure were at least entertaining the thought of military maneuvers in China, whether that be large scale or not, obviously never came to fruition. But for whatever reason, Mao put the country on red alert in late 1969. One thing this did was it allowed Mao to send more undesirables to the countryside, which is something he wanted to do anyway, and he wanted to prepare the civilians for war. This was something that was always a goal of the Cultural Revolution. Remember that for Mao, the ultimate communist was three parts. One part worker, one part student, and one part soldier. So preparing the country for war fits right in with what he was trying to do during the Cultural Revolution. The responses to Mao's call for war varied from place to place. Some people ignored it, knowing that for the most part it was nonsense and manipulation. Sadly, some people panicked, selling their possessions, moving drastically to the countryside as Mao encouraged. Some people just rejoiced in what was happening, buying into the propaganda completely and gearing up for war as much as they could, but most people just followed along with the plan. They just kind of went with the flow because, in many ways, you don't want to go against the flow during the Cultural Revolution. Mao wanted the whole country mobilized, and one of the things he wanted was he had a vision for an underground network of tunnels that could connect China, and he wanted everyone to take part in this. So here's what he said. He proposed, quote, The best way would be to dig shelters underneath houses, roughly a meter deep. If we connect all the houses with tunnels, and each household digs its own shelter, the state will not have to incur any expenses, end quote. Here we go again with another of Mao's schemes. Entire underground cities were now being made. You had schools, you had clinics, you had restaurants, theaters, factories, you name it. There was underground operations going on, mainly in the big cities in China, but really throughout the country. The problem was that as the dirt and mud became excess and as people were digging up all this stuff, it began clogging up the cities. Obviously, the average person isn't an engineer. They don't know how to properly dig a tunnel. So fatal accidents, cave-ins, houses where foundations were destroyed and collapsed, all of this stuff was going on. Just like the Great Leap Forward where people were throwing their household possessions into the steel furnaces to try and boost the output of steel, now the item was these bricks for these underground tunnels. So people would tear down their houses, their possessions, give up their furniture, whatever it took to help feed this brick production. Of course, the quality was poor, and not to mention sometimes the furnaces where these bricks were created would explode, killing people. And what's it all for? Again, the idea is just kind of a throwaway line from Mao with these underground cities, but everyone had to take part in it. Everyone had to be a part of this worthless effort. But in many ways, in the cities, it did build unity, and it gave people a distraction from the horrors of the Cultural Revolution. And really, ultimately, that was Mao's goal with this whole mobilization of the country for war, was to bring the people together who were starting to be splintered by the horrors of the revolution. So it's another example of governments throughout history using nationalism and war as a smokescreen to manipulate the common people. Speaking of war, Mao also tried to pull a Joseph Stalin in Operation Barbarossa, and he wanted to move his factories from the big cities and from the border areas inland, into rural China, into the middle of nowhere, anticipating a possible invasion by the Soviet Union. Many people were forced to undertake this venture of not only moving themselves to the countryside, but moving important factories as well. 
this went about as effectively as anything else during the Cultural Revolution. You had shortages of materials, lack of food, people being worked to death. Here's one worker talking about the campaign, quote, We didn't have anything, not even coal to cook with, and the hills were covered only in scrub brush that was hardly fit for burning. We wandered around with just one set of clothes, a wide-brimmed hat to protect us from the sun, and a canteen. As for transportation, we had nothing but our own two feet. End quote. This operation of Mao trying to pull a Joseph Stalin and move all these factories into the countryside was called the Third Front. In addition to the horrible conditions on the ground during this Third Front operation, some economists have estimated that this was the second biggest waste in terms of economic allocation in the history of the Chinese Communist Party, behind, of course, only the Great Leap Forward. What the Third Front and this mass movement of people into the countryside did was it refocused the top levels of the Communist Party on the countryside. It seemed like at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, if you weren't in a village or a community that was near a big city, or you weren't taking part in the political uh, infighting of the Cultural Revolution, you were sometimes forgotten about, which led to a period of decollectivization. Sometimes black markets would appear, a little bit of privatization, a little bit of local trading that the party didn't necessarily know about, or maybe they looked the other way. But during this period of movement into the countryside, what ends up happening is instead of decollectivization, you start getting recollectivization. One Chinese villager called it the continuation of the Great Leap Forward. The party began to call it the Learn from Desai movement, where there was a collectivist community in a place called Desai, and it was based on the idea of self reliance, this one single commune producing everything they need not needing any assistance from trade or from the government or from anyone else. Mao and the party wanted to re-implement this into other areas of China, and what you basically had was a fresh round of collectivization and a fresh round of suffering for the people that had to go through it. In addition to the people suffering, which I think I've highlighted a lot in this series, one aspect we haven't talked about much is the assault on nature that collectivization and communism created in China. So any part of nature or the environment that was not deemed useful for producing grain or whatever else the Communist Party thought they needed at the time was completely destroyed. Communism was horrible for the environment. One person described showing up to one of these collectivist areas and describing what he saw, quote, On the land before me, abandoned fields stretched in all directions. Now covered with a thick layer of salt, they looked like dirty snowfields, or like orphans dressed in mourning clothes. They had been through numerous storms since being abandoned, but you could still see the scars of plow tracks running across their skin. Man and nature together had been flogged with whips here. The result of learn from desire was to create a barren land on whose alkaline surface not a blade of grass would grow. End quote. The collectivist campaigns had no problem trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Another villager said, quote, So we built terraces on the mountain and carried earth and fertilizer. On every spare meter of earth we tried to grow grain, but the mountain was never suitable for growing grain. It's only good for trees, end quote. So instead of having an economy based more on comparative advantage, where in areas where you have good trees, maybe that's where you have the lumber industry, and areas that are good for grain, uh, you grow grain there. The party wanted everyone to be growing grain, so you're not maximally taking advantage of all the resources that you have. The areas that are good for trees, they're trying to grow grain, and it's not going to grow there. And then the areas that are good for grain, they're overworking. Lakes were drained 
forests were cut down, rivers were diverted, soil was ruined, you name it. We've talked a lot about the destruction of ideas, cultures, people, the human suffering, the animal suffering, but now the environmental suffering and the environmental destruction. The Cultural Revolution truly affected everything in China. Historian Judith Shapiro talks about the relationship between Mao, the Communist Party, and nature. Quote, The relationship between humans and nature during the Mao era was distinctive in Chinese history. Maoism rejected both Chinese tradition and modern Western science. The effort to conquest nature was highly concentrated and oppositional motivated by utopianism to transform the face of the earth and build a socialist paradise, and characterized by coercion, mass mobilization, enormity of scale, and great human suffering. The articulation of Mao's war against nature is striking for its overtly adversarial expression and disregard of objective scientific principles. End quote. So that's a fancy academic way of saying that communism, and in particular this Chinese brand of communism with Mao Zedong at the head of the ship was horrible for the environment. As we've seen, almost everything Mao touched in China would be destroyed. Okay, so that's going to do it for the penultimate episode of this series. In the next episode, the Cultural Revolution is going to come to a conclusion. The top levels of the party are in disarray as they discover the health of Chairman Mao is declining. The emergence of a new gang of four, as well as some old leaders like Deng Xiaoping and others, will battle it out for control over the future of China. But it's always the ordinary people who suffer the most and who are the driving forces of change in many ways. So the next episode in the series will be the last one on the Cultural Revolution. We'll go for as long as it takes. Um, Thanks for listening. As always, if you like the episode, you can review it on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Leave a rating. That helps a lot. Um, You can always... Find me on Twitter. Just type Reflecting History into the search bar. You can send me an email at reflectinghistory at gmail.com. It's been great to hear from a lot of you guys. So, uh, as always, thanks for listening and be good.